Uh, I think it's about time. So we'll go ahead and start. Uh, let's see. How do I do this? I just do that. Okay. Who's in GIS? So we're going to talk about uh, GIS and uh, the cloud solutions. Uh, different cloud providers offer different things. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the data sets that are out there. Uh, Tiger data set, uh, which has, which is the federal government uh, gives you. It's free. It's open. Uh, and you can download the shape files for the states, uh, the counties. You can download the roads and be able to display those out. Um, the World Data Set uh, is another website that you can get into and download all the country information for around the world uh, along with states and counties uh, and you know, different levels of data sets. We'll also talk about the uh, tints um, where you can uh, download these and these are uh, images that you can load into your data set to give you uh, like the elevation maps. Uh, already preloaded in, so you don't have to calculate them out. Uh, aviation map, uh, so we're going to talk about the great circle formula. We'll talk about aircraft performance and taxes. So I'm going to actually run you through how to actually price out a charter flight using a Challenger 601 aircraft. And uh, we'll uh, go take a flight in it and show you how much it costs. And we're going to do it with all the taxes and everything. Uh, uh, because I still have access to the airport database that we used back in the, in the charter days when I was working for them, and, and I've looked up all the current tax rates uh, to, to do, this uh, do this presentation last year. Um, we're going to talk about how to then take this old school map and actually do it in PostGIS, and how much faster it's going to be. And then you need to actually look at your data. QGIS is a nice open source uh, project that allows you to visualize all your GIS data. It will take these data, which you don't have to load into Postgres. You can actually store these as zip files on your hard drive and point GIS to them, and it will then actually display them. So it can hook up into the flat files, it can hook up into Postgres <coughs> and other data sources and bring all the data together and layer it and display it out. So that's really nice in QGIS. Um, I've got an example of the Google Map API. I do not have my Bing Map finished. Uh, if you download the presentations, if this post-it note is up here in this corner, there it means there is document, there's uh, extra notes on that slide, links to different documentation, to the different websites I'm talking about. All that information is in the notes section of the PowerPoint. Uh, so that's why. If it has a note on that, in that upper corner, you will want to download the slides to get those extra notes. Okay, installing PostGIS. Enterprise DB has their Stack Builder, which is a simple way to install it for Windows. Uh, there's a Winnie, which is an experimental release to do it. OSX, uh, there's a variety of different ways to install it. Although I have run into people who have try different methods and then uninstall and then work with the other method and it won't properly install because the other one has left things behind in the Mac one. So I've heard that that's problematic. Uh, Red Hat, you know, there's a Yum RPM ABT repository for Ubuntu and Debian OpenSUSE has a repository for it. There are other installation packages, uh, Big SQL, which was run by OpenSCG, which is now bought, uh, got bought out last year by Amazon. So they're all Amazon employees now. Uh, Enterprise DB, of course, where we were talking about the Stack Builder. Uh, but they provide it also for the uh, Linux, uh, for the Unix-based operating systems. <coughs> download sources. Uh, so you can download from postgis.net and go to source and actually compile your own version, which is what we do with everything at work. We actually build all of our stuff from source. We don't use any of the repositories. Um, that's because we want extra flags on there that aren't in the standard builds. Um, and then we have our own in-house repository where we feed everything out to our servers through uh, Chef. Uh, we do a lot of stuff through Chef now. Um, to compile this source code, you will need these extra projects already on your machine to be able to do the compile. So that's why I have them listed here. Uh, the basic, if you've got these already installed, all you need to do is to download it, uh, untar it, change the directory, configure it, make it, and do it, make it install. Simple as that. 
easy to do if you've got all the pre-requirements pre already in there. In the cloud world, now this was updated 418 of last year, so it is a little bit out of date. Um, and this shows you the different Postgres versions to what GIS version is available on Amazon. Google uh, has it, but they don't have the PG routing. And Microsoft has it, and they do have the PG routing, they just don't display what version, and I haven't bothered to log in and check yet. Um, so PG routing, I'm not covering in this presentation, but it's what allows you to do things like turn-by-turn -turn directions. So PG routing requires PostGIS already installed. And so when you, uh, let's say, go to OpenStreetMaps and you say, I want to go from place A to point place B, it's going to figure out the route on the roads. That's PG routing that figures that out for you. And you could do things uh, like in the aircraft world, air, uh, and I did not bring them with me today, the aircraft map. I actually have aircraft maps. So there's uh, low altitude and high altitude maps, which show the uh, main airplane routes uh, that they fly. So when you, you fly as uh, one of the big scheduled airlines, they fly specific routes. Those routes are actually predefined highways in the sky. And there are maps of all these highways you could actually load those as rows into your database and actually be able, instead of doing the great circle map, you could actually use, you go from this airport to this airport and figure out the route using PG routing and actually get uh, an even better route. Now, exact, more exact time. Although, um, uh, you need to buy something like the WINS database from Boeing uh, because there are high altitude winds that you got to take into effect to change direction at different times of year. I'm not covering that in this presentation either. Okay. U.S. Census Bureau data. That's where you get the Tiger data sets. So uh, there are shape files. You can get them all the way up to the current year. This says 2017. You'll have this year's up there by now. Um, in the 20, 2006 and older, they're in a line file format. They're not shapefile, but you need a shapefile to load them into Postgres. <coughs> now, here are some of the data sets that are available to you. So, like, you can get the uh, American Indian uh, area geography. Uh, you can get census tracts. You can get congressional districts for if you're doing uh, voter uh, type stuff. Um, School districts, if you're interested in that, uh, states and uh, uh, state level data. Um, you can get urban zones, zip code zones. Um, for like, uh, we use zip code zones when I was doing a system for limousine companies, where you want to find the all the limousine companies closest to the area where the person works, and so that, uh, that's where you want the zip code. <clears throat> Uh, but you can also download things like roads and landmarks and things like that. And you can get all the schools, you can get all the fire departments, uh, all the hospitals. So you can download all this data for free uh, from the Census Bureau and be able to use those. Um, and also uh, the emergency, uh, the federal uh, FEMA. From FEMA you can get data sets for like the hurricanes. So let's say you want to find every hospital affected by the hurricanes in Texas. You could download the shape file for the outline of all the places affected in Texas and then look at all the hospitals in that area and be able to say, okay, these are the hospitals or the schools affected inside the hurricane area and be able to get that type of data. In fact, I did that for, for the company. Um, Pre-requirements, you're going to need something like wget or 7-zip. I've got links for those to download. Now, when you, uh, what you want to do the first time you're using GIS, it comes with a sample database. That's going to say post-GIS, the version number, underscore sample. Load that database in, and there, in there, there is this table that you will want to edit. You want to change your tiger year to what year worth of data you want to download. You'll want to change the website 
by the way, it says HTTP here. Don't do that. That is a big mistake. Switch it to FTP. Why? It's fine if you want to download one state worth of data. But if you try and download the entire country's worth of data off the HTTP site, they will block your IP address. I had that happen to me. Um, so, and by default, this comes with HTTP in there. So if you decide, oh, I want the entire country now that I played with one state, you screwed yourself. Switch this to FTP. Big thing you need to do. Staging folder, you can set that. That's the local directory on your system where it's going to store all this data as it downloads it. And then uh, your data schema and your staging schema, you shouldn't need to change those. Those are uh, predefined by default, but if you want to change them, you can. Okay, then there is the next t uh, table you want to edit, the Tiger Loader Platform. And this has two records in it. One is a sample record for Linux, uh, and one is a sample record for Windows, where your WGET and your 7-zip and things like that are located. Um, you can also put in your uh, password, database, stuff like that. Um, you know, so there, there's settings for that in there. Now, oh, so it's got a, a, a Windows back file or, or SH. So what, do, what we're going to do is once we've set this data up, we can then log into Postgres and log into our sample database and select this function, loader generate nation script and I took one of those records out of that last table and actually made a copy of it and named it Lloyd. So I have my original sample in there. And then you want to have, take the output of this function and save it to loader back because I was testing this on my Windows box. Mm. Um, instead, I run the Linux systems at work, so we're on OpenSUSE now. No, we're on Ubuntu now. Mm. We, started as, we started with Solaris servers. We went to Enterprise SUSE and then Open SUSE, and now we're on Ubuntu. Um, but uh, I don't have GIS on there, so I use my desktop, which is Windows, to test stuff outside of my work test environment. So I had it output as loader bat. You do this as loader.sh if you're executing the same command on a Linux system. Um, and then you can run that pod. That file will then go out and download the data for you and load it into Postgres. Um, oh, it'll download the data. Now, it doesn't load into Postgres. Then you can use Shape2 PGSQL, which is a command line program, and you can write the data into Postgres from any shape file. So whether it's from the Tiger data set or other data sets. But what you do need to specify is this for which SRID your data is. Because different data sets are different SRIDs. Uh, basically, they're different mapping layouts uh, for where your zero, zero point is on your map. So you will want to do the correct encoding. You need to look at your data set that you're getting, find out what it, which encoding it is, and use the same correct one when you store it. Um, now, this is command line method method, which is fine if you want to script it. If you don't want to script it, Enterprise DB, if you install their version of the installer, they have a Windows version of that same application, uh, which you can use this window. If you download and install it on your Windows laptop or desktop, this can then point not to the local version of Postgres, but then you can point to your Unix version of Postgres and take your shape files and load them up into your Unix version. It doesn't have to install them into your local copy. So you uh, can edit your connection details here, and you can uh, to add your file, which you can point to your shape file here. This is the global administration uh, level zero, so this is all the country level data, and it's going to the public schema to this table name uh, is Geome Data. And I can set the SRID here. This is an editable field. I can just go and edit that. And I want it to create the table. If the table already exists, 
you uh, can tell it just to insert that data into the existing table. So it won't actually create the table. Um, and then if you click the options, this is the option uh, flag here. So you can set uh, the database encoding, things like that. Um, you know, like you can also tell the automatically index after load if it's creating the table. You can do things like that. Oh, also, while this is setting as a, a geom column, if you want geography instead, you can also check this box here, and then it will use geography instead of geom, which I'm going to talk about the importance later on. And then click import, and it will import that shape file into your database for you. So let's take the tiger data set, load it in, and now we, uh, and we want both state and county, and let's find out what counties are in what state. So these are the basic queries on how to do that. So from our entire state data set, we can left join to the county data set, and we can say covered by, this county is covered by this state, uh, geo and where the state is Washington State. And that will return us a list of all the counties in Washington State. Now, GIS, just like most things, has more than one way to do everything. So besides the covered by, you can also use the contains command. Both of those will work. And there's links to the documentations for both of these commands actually on this slide. World data set. So this is the link to go download the world data set. And there are, you can download it as a single file. I recommend downloading them as the individual files. There are six files here that you can download. Country is the admin level zero. State is admin level one or province. Uh, county is admin level two. Uh, admin level three, uh, you can only find in Canada, South America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. Level four, you can only find in some parts of Africa and Europe. And level five is only in Europe, in some parts of Europe. So it just goes narrower and narrower. I'm not sure what those extra levels are. I have never used three, four, and five. I've only used the uh, zero, one, and two. And by the way, there are some big differences between this data set in the Tiger data set from the US Census Bureau. In fact, I'm visually going to show you the differences on a map later on. And in some cases, you may wish to use Tiger's data set, and in other cases, you may wish to use this Global Administration Database data set. OK, aviation map. Uh, so this is part of it, geometry versus geography, those geom versus geoc uh, fields. So geometry is flat maps. Geography is where you want to deal with the curvature of the Earth in the map. So you want a different type of data set, uh, a different type of point, uh, depending on which type of thing that you're working with. So if you want to know what county is in what state, geometry is just perfect. If you want to calculate the differences between airports. So if you want to know what airport is in what county, you want geometry. If you want to calculate the distance between two airports, you want geography. So in some data sets, you may wish to store both fields because the time to calculate the field is very intensive to switch between them. So it's better to have one of each in your data set. By the way, after this presentation, if you've got GIS questions, remember the guy who I was talking about who worked with the open street maps and is now working for the Amazon maps? He's sitting in the back with his hand raised up. Raise up your hand. <laughs> so, he is much more of a GIS expert than I am, because I do not count myself as a GIS, GIS expert. I am a Postgres expert, but not a GIS expert like he is. So definitely ask him questions. Um, but by the way, if you are available for our 3.30, ask the experts to come in and uh, ask him questions. They'll be in this conference room. World Administration Boundary Database. Uh, Oh, I don't know why I have that at the top, because I'm not talking about that. Uh, spherical log cosines. That's the one that copy and paste there is where the copy slide forward. 
Uh, so there's two main formulas for doing great circle math. Spherical law of cosines and Haberstein formula. They are different formulas. Um, this one is uh, less subject to rounding errors on short distances. Uh, but on the longer distances, you'll want to use the spherical law of cosines. So normally for flights, we want to use this. Uh, but you can use either, either method. Um, they don't make that much of a difference, especially in pricing. Um, when I've looked at the pricing of it, it's pennies, not, not a big deal in, in what we're dealing with. Um, so your la latitude and longitude, uh, if you've got that stored in the database, uh, that's where you just fill those out. Uh, the one, uh, one will be one airport, the two is going to be the other airport. And this is how I wrote it when I worked with the Charter Airlines. All, Postgres can do all this math internally. It has no problem doing this math. So you can actually run that formula. That's going to give you out the distance. But that distance is in radians. So now you need to get that radians into something we normal people understand. So we need to take that D and we need to convert it to, well, in, air, in airlines, we want nautical miles. Uh, and nautical miles, people think of that as ships. Well, airplanes use nautical miles too. Uh, multiplying uh, D by 180 times 60 divided by pi will turn that radians into nautical miles for you. So all of this actually gets attached to that formula too. Um, because there are two standard billing methods in the airline industry, either nautical miles well, not, or nautical meters, uh, depending on what country you're in, or time. Those are the two main ways air, uh, charter companies bill out. Okay, math. We're gonna, uh, this is going to go over some of the basic math, and then we'll, after this we'll start actually getting into actually writing the aircraft examples. Okay, so ST distance. This allows us to calculate the distance between two geography points. So we can take the originating geography uh, airport and the destination geography airport and get a distance out of that, of, uh, of course, because this uh, Coast GIS was written in Vancouver, BC, the results are in meters. So it's in meters or you can get it out in degrees. Uh, so we need to actually turn this into nautical miles. And in the case of a Challenger 601, we want it less than 3,000 nautical miles. Um, yes, you can fly a little bit farther than that in Challenger 601, um, but that's if you're flying for max distance, not max fuel. So um, you have a choice with aircraft. You can either have max weight or max distance, but you can't have both. Because uh, there's a trade-off for how far you can fly based at versus how heavy you load the plane. Um, it also, uh, how heavy you load the plane plays a big part into how long the runway needs to be. Let's say you go down to Sedona, Arizona, that airport. Um, and in fact, we flew our Challenger 601 in there. And it's got a runway that's plenty long for the plane, except Sedona gets so hot that if you need to take off with a heavy load of fuel to get to your next destination, you have to take off before it gets hot because you lose your lift capability in the heat, so you've got to take off very early in the morning before it gets too warmed up there to be able to lift off from that airport with a heavy load. Um, okay, so the distance, it comes out in meters divided by 1,000 to get kilometers, uh, divided by 0.53996 to turn that into nautical miles. That's what I was doing there. SD distance within. So instead of finding out how the distance between the two airports, I want to find out all the airports that are within this distance of each other. So I can say originating airport, destination airport, I want 3,000 nautical miles, so I actually have to times that by 1852 to turn that nautical miles into meters. And so it'll say, okay, I want, to, is this within uh, yes or no, uh, so it'll return a yes or no, is this within the 3,000 nautical miles of each other? So you could scroll, uh, run a query across all the airports to find out it, uh, it, 
is the destination and origination airports within 3,000 nautical miles. ST contains. So this uh, is, is this airport within the state? Uh, and you, that, why do you want to know if an airport's in the state, within a state? Taxes. If it is in the continental United States, you have one tax rate. If it is Hawaii, you have a different tax rate. If it is Alaska, you have a different tax rate. If one end of the flight is outside the United States, you can have international tax rate. Uh, so you actually need to know for tax purposes, is this airport within the United States? In which state is it in? Um, or is it outside the United States? So that's why you want to be able to use the ST contains. And this is using the geometry, not the geography, because this uh, is dealing with the flat maps of the Tiger data set. And so uh, geometry is just fine for doing this. ST point, if you've got a latitude and longitude, you can turn this into a geometry point. Um, because the PostGIS wants to use the points but your data source data set is most likely going to have longitude and latitude. Now you can also add elevation to it and actually give the height of the airport uh, so you can actually have a, three, a 3D point. And you want to set the SRID of that point uh, so that your um, it can adjust the maps correctly. So if your map is one SRID and your points are a different SRID, it will actually do the conversion. But it is better for you to set them the... So if you load at one data set, but your map is a different SRID, it is better for you to convert your SRIDs to the correct one before you run your queries because the conversion takes too much time. It's gonna slow you down too much. So it is best to have all your data sets in, in a single SRID, even though you may load different SRIDs into your database. Airport table. So this is a scaled down version of the airport table that I use. Uh, so it's got the airport name, it has got the identifier. By the way, you may not recognize the four digit identifier because a lot of airports in the United States drop off the first character. Like Seattle, people know it as SEA. It's actually KSEA. Uh, most people don't realize that. It has longitude and latitude. And something we actually want to know about. What type of fuel is out the airport? There's avgas for the really small planes, you know, uh, and there's jet A fuel. If you are running a jet like a Challenger 601 and you need to refuel, it needs to have jet A at the airport. It can't have just avgas because it's not going to work for you. The elevation of the airport. So which sectional map is it on uh, for you to be able to see the routes? How long is the longest runway? You need to make sure your airplane can run there because the area, airport database has 10 foot runways. How do you land an airplane on a 10 foot runway? With a, as a helicopter. And is it a rural airport? Why do you need to know that? Taxes don't apply at rural airports. Ooh. Yes, so these really small airports, like in the town of Monroe or the town of Skycomish or uh, Snohomish, there's actually no federal excise tax at those airports because they are designated rural airports. Okay, so we got our basic aircraft cable in there but it's not set up to use to do deal with post gis so we can alter the table and we can add a geographic column uh, and this is the uh, data type for it and then we update our airports table and set the geographic column to the make point of the longitude and latitude uh, and we can take the elevation field out, uh, but it's not in metric, so we need to convert it to metric. And we need to set the SRID of the data so it's correct mapping and say it's a geography field. Now, this confused me. I spent several days figuring this out. 
because if you do the old school math, it doesn't play a difference into it, but it does if you're using PostGIS. The airport database I have is inverted on the longitude. They're opposite. So I actually have to sub uh, zero subtract the longitude to get the correct uh, positive and negative on it because it's actually inverted on the database I use. Uh, then you want to index it, so you do use a gist index on the geography field so that your queries will be faster. And you also want to create a, a geom version of the same thing. So this is the same thing deal for doing a geom. And in this case, I did not bother with the elevation. Uh, because when you're dealing with geoms, you're dealing with a flat map. Okay, and we've talked about this is just uh, geom versus geography. We've already discussed that. There are several places I say the same thing. Okay, aircraft performance. So when you are looking at an aircraft and trying to calculate how much to charge between two locations, what you need to know is how fast does the airplane fly? How far can it fly? What's the max number of people? Why do you need the max number of people? plays a part into taxes because some of the taxes are charged based upon the cost of the flight, but other taxes are paid upon the number of passengers in the flight. So you need to know that. Max weight the aircraft can fly. Uh, how much does it cost to uh, per hour or per nautical mile? That's your billing rate. Because you're either going to use one of those two uh, to do your billing. What type of fuel does it use? Uh, that so you make sure the airport you're landing at has fuel. Minimum runway length uh, so that you can take back off. Uh, this is a real incident that happened down in Vancouver, Washington, uh, where a commercial airline jet mistook the rural airport for the Portland airport. And they landed at this small rural field. And they actually did not fire the pilot immediately. What they did to make it even worse for this guy, they had to strip the airplane bare. They had to gut the entire interior of the aircraft so they could get enough lift to lift it out. And they made that pilot fly it out of there, uh, out of that airport as his last flight before he was fired. <laughs> yes, yes, this is a real incident. It happened years ago, but you can look it up online. This is a Challenger 601. Uh, we had two of these aircraft. Uh, they're a gorgeous aircraft. Uh, you, they are stand-up height inside. You can walk down them. We have had them in executive configuration. What that means is you can take the seat and rotate it 180 degrees. You can lay it down. It had couches on board. Uh, so uh, you could actually uh, lay down on the couch if you wanted during the flight. Uh, they have. Uh, uh, one of them had a single stewardess, uh, steward, stewardess on board, the other one had two. Um, and one was nine-seater that we had big arguments over the federal government with, and the other one was a 12-passenger. There are some interesting rules between uh, nine or less and ten or more, and that's flight data recorders. Flight data recorders are required on ten or more aircraft and are not required on nine or less. The problem with our Challenger 601 that came from the East Coast and was on a charter certificate as a nine or less on the East Coast, came to us in Washington here, and we dealt with the FAA in Washington, and they said this aircraft is a 10 or more because that jump seat, even though it's labeled crew only for the steward stewardess on board, actually counts as a passenger seat. And we fought, fought bitterly with them for several years, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in actually what helped take the company under was our fight with them. Um, and it wasn't until we went through the Freedom of Information Act and actually got their emails back with Washington, D.C. with the guy who actually wrote the ruling, where the guy in Washington, D.C. wrote back to the Seattle office and said, this is a nine or less aircraft. And in the next email on, after we've asked him to re-ask, he goes, this is a nine or less aircraft. I repeat, this is a nine or less aircraft. And then the Seattle FAA uh, sends us an email saying, oh, Washington DC ruled this as a 10 or more aircraft. Oh yes, we, thought we got all that, those internal emails from Washington DC 
telling Seattle that it was a nine or less and Seattle telling us it was a 10 or more. Yeah. <laughs> we sued the federal government and while well, they said, well, it's not our fault, we will say it is partially our fault. We'll allow you to pick any airport in the United States to move your principal base of operations to get out from underneath Seattle, which they do not do normally. If you want to move your principal base of operations, you have to close that operations point. Because no matter how many places you open up locations, your first location is where you get all your auditing done at as your principal base of operations. They allowed us because we were able to show wrongfulness on the government's part. They allow us to move our principal operations to Scottsdale, Arizona, which is very business friendly. And after two years of fighting with Seattle over this, we had our airplane up on a charter certificate in six months. Big difference between what place you're doing. Um, so this Challenger 601, it can fly with max fuel, not max weight, max fuel, 3,337 nautical miles. Now, if you're running max payload, uh, which is max weight, they can only do 2,182 miles. So you see the weight to distance ratio here. And that's why we're going to spick, uh, we're going to use a 3,000 nautical mile as an average in between to say this is what we're going to use for our distance. Um, but if you've got the weight of stuff, you'll actually want to adjust your nautical mile distance. This aircraft can fly at a max speed of 425 nautical miles per hour. The problem is you don't normally want to run your engines at full speed because it's hard on your engines. So you actually want to back off at full speed. So we're going to use, in our formula, we're going to use 400 nautical miles an hour. This requires a minimum runway length of 2,850 uh, feet. So we're going to say 3,000 feet runway, and it requires the Jet A fuel. Uh, we're going to use our 12-passenger version, which was the bigger of the two airplanes. And 11 years ago, it cost $10,000 an hour to fly this aircraft. That included the cost of the fuel, the cost of the pilots, and the cost of stewardesses, uh, and all the maintenance on the aircraft because aircraft have three different maintenance schedules. They have a number of uh, cycles on the engines, a uh, number of uh, takeoffs and landings, and um, amount of time, a um, number of months. And so every part on there has a schedule on, on um, uh, maintenance, uh, for, uh, which is required on all commercial aircraft. If it's privately owned, you don't have to follow the rules. But if it's a commercial aircraft, you do have to follow those maintenance uh, cycles, because uh, otherwise you can get heavily penalized by the government, which you've seen um, uh, air companies get hit for. And the um, FAA does come in and do audits of the maintenance logs, and if they catch you, you are in trouble. Taxes. So, IRS Publication 720 deals with taxes. Uh, transportation of air by person is <coughs> item number 26 within the 720 publication. And it is $4.10 per passenger uh, for a non-rural airport. For uh, Alaska and Hawaii, it is $9.10 more expensive to fly there. And then if uh, one end of the flight is international, it is $18.30 per person that we're paying. Uh, rural airports, they drop it. And then there is the federal excise tax, which is 7.5% uh, of the uh, cost of the flight. So there are two taxes. One is uh, the pet tax, and, one, and there's the uh, per person tax. Uh, or domestic segment tax is what it is. Uh, this one's called. Uh, there are other taxes, uh, which are, these are only the ones for passenger flights. There are ones for cargo flights that you'll also find on uh, Publication 720. If you're shipping stuff by rail, uh, that's also covered under Publication 720. So there's a bunch of things covered by that same publication. 
Okay, query in the airport database. So this is that spherical law of cosines, which I used when I worked for the Charter Airlines Company. Um, there it is. <laughs> That's the get in nautical miles. You can see that is ugly to read. Then we want to take that nautical miles divided by 400 uh, nautical miles per hour that the aircraft is going to fly to get us the hours times that by $10,000 per hour will give us a rate of the aircraft, uh, how much to charge for that flight, excluding taxes. And we want our originating airport to be SeaTac and our destination airport to be anything but SeaTac, but an airport that has Jet A fuel and has a runway greater than 5,000 feet, because we actually want some room on our runway, and is uh, within 3,000 nautical miles of each other. So we have the correct distance, and we want to order it by the third field, which is our distance in nautical miles. So instead of having to replicate this entire formula down in the order by, we can just uh, specify the ordinal position of the output field that we wish in the order by. That's uh, something not everybody realized. Now, when you save this as a view, and then you load back your view definition, it will actually replace this three with this entire formula for you. Um, but this is a shortcut uh, that is very nice if you've got a long formula to make sure you don't do a typo in this formula when you're putting it down here. And of course, I hard-coded the, uh, the amounts in here. In my, in my real usage case, I actually looked up the aircraft in the aircraft table because we had multiple aircraft. And different aircraft had different billing rates. Because besides the Challenger 601s, uh, we had King Air C90s, we had 200s, uh, you know, various different aircraft. Hey, quick question. So you have three, uh, I guess three fields there, I guess, that have the long formula? Yes. Does it optimize out that one in the calculation, or, or does it make sense to assign a variable to it so you don't? How does that work in general? Yes. Um, or is well, it actually, if you new? did uh, outer select queries, uh, then it will only do the calculation once, and you can take the value of this and use the next one up, okay. and the next one up. Uh, the problem is it doesn't display nice when I want to write it as a slide. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I did it for easy of display versus uh, faster speed. Okay, that's what I figured. Oh, so this is the results down here at the bottom. Um, so out of the results, I picked Las Vegas. Let's say we want to fly to Las Vegas from Seattle. Um, so the ending airport is KLAS, and it is 752.88 nautical miles. It takes 1.88 hours to fly there in that aircraft, and it costs $18,822 to fly there without taxes. Um, and that's for 12 passengers in that Challenger. That's with uh, well, it didn't matter how many passengers you took. One passenger, 12 passengers, doesn't matter. That's how much it's going to cost. It will make a difference in the taxes, which we're going to go to. Now, this is spherical law of cosines. This is Haberstein formula. This is the one that uh, uh, has less rounding errors on shorter distances, but does not really make a difference into uh, what's happening with the pricing. Uh, so otherwise, it's exactly the same, except the formula that's actually here is, is the slightly different formula. And we're using all the longitude and latitudes here, you know, destination, originating. Uh, so it's in there. So. Now, here it is using ST distance in PostGIS. Those three big lines and now these three small lines. Much easier to read and understand what's going on. You know, so we have our, our originating geography point, our destination geography point. It puts that out in meters, divide that by 1,000 to get our kilometers, times that by this to get our nautical miles, divide by 400 to get our hours, and then we want to times that by $10,000 an hour, but I want to round that to the nearest penny uh, and get our rate because I don't need all the sub, sub pennies in there. 
And I use the distance down here also. You say I want it within 3,000 nautical miles of each other. And I also switched how I was asking for the, uh, so I switched these from the where clause into the uh, join statement. And in the where clause, I just uh, kept it uh, where the originating airport is, Seattle. And actually, I didn't exclude Seattle as the destination airport, which I had in the other one. But. Oh, because what we did was we had a special, uh, uh, so the reason why I actually did this stuff was we actually printed price books if you bought a membership uh, and you flew out of uh, Payne Field. We listed all the airports you could fly to at a single duty day and back to Payne Field and how many hours you could spend at that destination airport with max passengers and we had this price book that was printed out uh, or was searchable on our website. and. That price book was generated by running this whole set of uh, formulas. It was actually running the spherical law of cosines and generated all the data out and exported it all out uh, CSV and then loaded it up into our uh, software that we used to uh, print our books and uh, published it out. So there was reasons I was actually working on this stuff. Okay, STD within. Uh, you can also use this also. Uh, down in the square clause here, I changed it down here. Uh, to say, okay, is this airport within 3,000 nautical miles of the, uh, is the destination airport within 3,000 nautical miles of the originating airport? Um, so I'm just showing you a different way to do the same thing. Okay, so now we want to add taxes. So is this a rural airport? If it's a rural airport, zero dollars. If it is not a rural airport, we actually need to calculate out the taxes. So we need to take our 7.5 federal excise tax. Um, if it is Hawaii or Alaska, we need to charge $9.10. Otherwise, we need to do the $4.10. If it's not a state, then it becomes $18.30 uh, because it's international. And so then we can calculate all the federal excise taxes. So now we have our rate of our $18,826 for the flight, plus $1,411 for our federal excise tax, plus our des uh, destination tax, which is uh, per person by 12 people is $49.20 for a total of $20,287 for that flight. That's your finished cost for that flight for maximum number of passengers. Uh, if you had a few less passengers, that would only reduce it in this particular flight by $4.10 per passenger that was not flying. So it does not make that much difference uh, by having one passenger or 12 passengers. It's, okay, what airports? Now, I ran that calculation and I found all the airports I could fly to from Seattle. Where are all those airports that you can reach? All these dots are the airports you can reach with that aircraft. Um, so uh, that started Seattle in here and spread out. My actual airport database actually covers the whole world here. But you can see the only the places that you can reach. By the way, we did fly to Hawaii and back. Okay. Oh, by the way, that was using QGIS, which is the open source project I'm going to talk about now. So QGIS is available on Linux. It's available on Mac OS. It's available on Windows. It's available on BSD. There is an experimental one on Android. And if you're using the Windows version like I was, there's both a 32-bit and a 64-bit version. You can download it from QGIS.org. And it can and does not have to get all of its data from Postgres. You can actually load the shape files directly into it, or if those shape files are zip, you can just point it at the zip file and it'll read it. It does not, you do not have to expand it first. Uh, and it will read other databases besides Postgres. Uh, so you can point it to uh, any, uh, any Microsoft SQL Server with GIS data. You can point it to Postgres. You can point it to the flat files and merge all that data together into sing one single view if you want. Not a problem. Uh, by the way, you can also update 